Okay, welcome everyone to another edition of Ozarks Voices, the Oral History Project at Missouri State University Libraries. My name is Tom Peters, I'm the Dean of Library Services at MSU. Today's date is the uh, December 13th, yes, it is. Um, 2022. It's uh, Tuesday and we're down in Branson talking with Mark Pearman. Mm -hmm. Mark, thanks very much. Well, it's nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, so how I know you, how I know of you, uh, we never met before just a few minutes ago, is you are the violinist on the Press Street show. Yes, I am. So how long have you been doing that before we get into that? Right. I, I've been playing with Presley's five years. Uh -huh. uh, before Presley's, I played for Mel Tillis about four years. It was uh, the last year and a half or so he was sick. So, yeah. but, but I was employed around four years with him. Uh -huh. um, and before Mel Tillis, I played a, a year with Blake Cooper. And before that, I was with the Cleverly's for, really? I think, three years. Yeah. It was three years, maybe maybe four years, something like that. Uh -huh. And before the Cleverly's, then I was with uh, Roy Clark for 17 years. Oh my gosh. And then before Roy Clark, I played with Loretta Lynn for a couple of years. Oh. And then uh, my wife's family had a theater here in town, the Lowe's Theater. And I, back in those days, the season was really short. You know, you'd work from Memorial to yeah. Labor Day. Yeah. And uh, I worked for Stars on the off season, and I got to work with Jerry Reed, and uh -huh. Dottie West, and so Dottie you Rodriguez. You traveled. traveled a lot. Yeah. Are you a native uh, Bransonite? Springfield. I was born in Springfield, actually in Galloway. Went to oh, Sequoia really? School, and yeah, oh. Pershing Elementary, and Glendale High School. Wow, you've been back lately? Is it probably hard? Oh yeah, I go all the time. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. My sister, my sister used to live almost on the same street we were born. That right. I was raised on. Uh huh. Good. Um. So before we get into talking about uh, uh, Harold Morrison. Um, so now the season's much longer. It's all the, it's what, it's like nine months now? Yeah, 10 months, yeah. It's, yeah. It goes all the way through the end of the year. Yeah. And uh, starts up in uh, March. Mid March. Yeah. 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 So um, I'll be playing here at the porch next year. This is my oh. last season with the Presleys. Oh, really? And okay. yeah, the great family. I, you know, yeah. Great show. Uh, it's time for me to have time, though. You know, uh, if you're in a, a show, we work six nights a week, ten months a year, and that's that's a lot. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's a huge commitment. It's yeah. you know you, you can't call in sick, or well, if you are, you know, we played sick a lot of times. Or, or you're the only you're the only, there's no there's no understudy. Or, there's no understudy. You, really? Yeah, they they uh, they they won't let you sub at Presley's, and I understand that. You know, they want it to be. They won't let their musicians play anywhere else because they want it to be a special right. thing when they come to their theater. That's the only place you can see these people. Uh -huh. And they, they treat us well. They're a great family. Yeah. In fact, the Presley's knew Harold really well. Really? I'll even go back to that. Yeah. When Harold passed, I was given his banjo. Yes. And Lloyd. You have Harold Morrison's banjo. Well, Gary Presley, okay. Gary Presley was a really close friend to Harold, too. And Gary's kids, Gary Presley's kids, knew Harold. He used to run around with them a lot. Well, my kids had never met Harold. So I gave that banjo to Gary to give to one of his kids so, you know, it would kind of stay, yeah. with, you know, the, the meaning would stay there. Or, yeah. you know, it would have some, the banjo would have some meaning. I still have Harold's dobro. Uh, in fact, funny story about that. Harold told me this story, and he was a character. But uh, so we're talking about Harold Morrison. Harold, I'm sorry, Harold Morrison. Uh, born 1931, died 1993. Yes. So he was only 62 when he died. Yes. Uh, born in High Lonesome, Missouri, one of my favorite place names yes. ever. Uh, yeah. I've actually been there. Just yes. made a point of going there. Pretty cool. It's high and it's lonesome. Yeah, that's right. right. It's it really is. Extreme Western cool. Douglas County. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. You know, was he born in in High, high Lonesome, or was it in just near? High you know, you know, you know I, much I, about the family? I never, yeah, I met I knew his sisters and his mom and dad. Uh -huh. And I never went to his home place. So I'm, I'm not sure about that. You know, I'm not sure. I, he always said, you know, we're on stage and he was from Highlands, Missouri. So that's all yeah. I knew. Yeah. 
That's all I do. In fact, that how yeah, I, if they're a farm family or you know, well, I'm I sure farm, that I um, don't some never was very big. Yeah, so. there there wasn't much up there. Um, but the way I got acquainted with Harold Morrison is my dad was a musician. My whole family plays music, uh -huh. and uh, my dad actually Harold was playing on the Jubilee. Yeah. And my dad was friends with Harold. And Harold moved to Nashville, I believe, with, to work for Kitty Wells. Is that right? Didn't he move to? He didn't, he didn't move to Nashville. What I've heard is that he and Jimmy Gately, well, they decided to just go their separate ways. It yes, wasn't, they did. It, it wasn't, uh, it was amicable. Right, yeah. But then he both ended up going to Nashville. Right. And then they played different groups and stuff, and they were session musicians. And, and, uh... Well, my dad is the one that moved him to Nashville. My dad and uncle loaded up their trucks and moved him and Eva Lou to Nashville. <laughs> and dad told me, and my, my brother, I mean, this was, I'm guessing early 60s, it had to be because I wasn't there yet. I, I was born in 61. So. Dad and my brothers and sisters told me that that they went to Loretta's house. Does that sound right? Did he live in maybe he was around Loretta? Yeah. In the early days, like that. Uh, yeah. But I think his first gig was Johnny Jack or Kitty Wells. Really? I think so. I think that was his in Nashville. I think that's, that's kind of what took him to Nashville. That's what I think. See, I just don't know enough about his life to really. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't. Uh, but anyway, here's the story on the Dobro. Going back to that. So he worked for Kitty Wells for a while. They worked for uh, actually the Wilbur Brothers. He was on the Wilbur Brothers television show. And then he worked for uh, Loretta. And then after Loretta, he worked for uh, George Jones and George Tandy. So this Dobro I got was uh, an early 30s Dobro. And he was working for George Jones, and he uh, had set his dobro next to the bus to get ready to load. And George was drunk and got in the bus and started the bus and drove off and drove over the neck of his dobro. Well, here's the good part about it: is Shot Jackson was a premier uh, steel player in Nashville. Everybody knew Shot Jackson. Fat Shots, one of the ones that started Showbud Guitar Company and all that. But he played for, he was a great steel player, played for a lot of acts also. But Shot put the neck back on this dobro. So I've got an original dobro body, and Shot Jackson put the neck back on it. Can you see that the neck's been damaged? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see that it's a different neck. You can see that it's a different neck. I also got Harold's little Gibson guitar, B25. And also, uh, he had a biscuit board. If you ever seen the Jubilee or seen any of the live shows, yeah. he had a. It was like a lap steel, and he'd sit it in his lap and put a fighter helmet on, and take the bar and act like it make the sounds like it was a an airplane. And, and yet he did this bit. And I've got that biscuit board too. Yeah. So I just can't. I'm still like uh, your dad and your brothers. My yes, my dad and uncle. Moved. My dad and my uncle moved Harold. Moved Harold to Nashville. They loaded up their trucks and moved to Nashville. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, uh, of course, we're interested in his Jubilee years. Did they ever talk about being a performing on the Jubilee? He did. Yeah. He, he talked what, a lot. What, what were his memories of? Him? He said it was, it was crazy. He, he said it was like, uh, you know, you know, they kind of got ready, and it was just like. In those days, it was live. He said, "Hoss, it was live, coast to coast." Yeah, and it was. You know, there was nine no million, time delay. Nine two million people watching. There was live. no time delay. Right. Whatever happened on that stage was—that's what happened. Um, we had a lot of great memories, a lot of funny memories. I probably can't tell some of them. <laughs> Red was one of my favorite singers too. I, I never got to meet Red. Red was a great entertainer. Great. Entertainer. Uh, you know, um, from what I know of him, just by you know reading different accounts and stuff. He was a good human being. Yeah, he was a great human being. Uh, but he had a uh, problem with the alcohol. Yeah. 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 Uh, but Harold had you know, great memories of all the people he 
I've seen this one. Yeah. It was a, you know, that, that's when shows were, they were actually produced, but there was so much excitement because they weren't produced. Yeah. Uh, they were, uh, and, and, and I, I think mean, it just, it was live television. Live television. Today, when we think we're seeing a live show, there's eight second delay built in, so there's yeah, you know, somebody drops the F bomb or yeah, there's some kind of wardrobe malfunction or something, you cut the block. Yeah, there's nothing live about what we see. You know, a lot of pitch correction and, and yeah. a lot of tracks. And, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of things that are fixed. And it's this, really live. This, I mean, you go back and listen to those listen to those shows and listen to the singers that were on the show. Man, they were right one. I mean, they were. Yeah. Pitch perfect. You know, the, the musicians were incredible. The other thing that amazes me, so as near as I can tell, the first Ozark Jubilee was uh, the day after Christmas, 1953. So late 1953. It wasn't nationally broadcast. That started in January of 55. But as near as I can tell, they did a show every week for almost seven years until it went off the national on September 24, 1960. They never missed a week. Yeah. They never took, you know, the month of August off. Yeah, right. They did a show every yeah. week. Well, and that's part of what Harold was saying. You know, Harold said they did the show and he said they'd jump in the car and they try to run and do two or three days during the week. You know, and, and make it back. You know, make it back. So they couldn't go very far. So we've actually been, um, there was no video tape back then. Yeah. But they made what they call kinescope, you know, kinescope. Yeah, okay, so Wayne Glenn is a local historian. Yeah. You know Wayne? Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah. Great guy. So Wayne, I've been down here 11 years. Um, and Wayne set up a meeting with me soon after I got here. He said, I found some kinescope for the old dark jubilee. You need to go put it back here. They were at the UCLA Film and Television Archive out in LA. Wow. And there was about 65 of them. So I pulled out there. They confirmed that they had some kinescopes in the middle of the review. I don't think they ever opened up the answer. I don't know how they got them. But I said, Would you sell them to us? No. Where'd you get them? As a matter of policy, we don't tell you where we're taking them to. They have a huge television archive. And so we this so then anyway, anyway we get and we end up digitizing and we paid UCLA film television. So we have about right now we have about 70 and I've just got some more that are in the pipeline to be put up online for free. So anyway, we have um one of them we had. So the show was done in 30 minute segments. That's kind of the way they thought about producing it. And sometimes it was a 90-minute show, sometimes for a while it was in its run, it was a 60-minute show, sometimes it was even only a 30-minute show. Some markets would only show, you know, a half an an hour of a 90-minute show or something. It always kind of had a, a complete stop, you know. And uh so anyway, I was um uh in 1955, Saturday night was the last Saturday night in 1955 was New Year's Eve. They did a show, New Year's Eve. And then I was reading accounts about Harold and Harold and uh, I think Speedy Howard and, Speedy, yeah. and, Speedy. and a couple other people, maybe Buster, Buster Fellows. When the show was done, they jumped in a car, drove to Ava, and played from nine to midnight <laughs> at the American <laughs> Legion Hall uh, at Ava. Uh, you know, so it's almost like the, you know, they were doing that a lot. It was all about the, you know, you, you didn't get paid much for appearing on the Jubilee, but you had nine million people watching. That's right. And so that would sort of fuel the personal appearance thing. And, yeah. uh, you know, Red would go all over the country doing personal appearances, but somebody like Harold would just kind of be working the region. Yeah. So um, I was just like, wow, man, they jumped in the car and drove to Ava back, back when I'm sure the road to Ava was not too good back then. No, I've, I've driven Highway uh, 60 to. Right. Yeah, Mansfield, and it was really curvy. Really, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and they got there in time to play the 9 to midnight gig. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what time was the Jubilee over? Was it like 8? You know, it really depended. I'm guessing it maybe was like 6.30 to 8 Central Time. Uh, so I don't know how they got over there. Well, sometimes, actually the other thing that is, 
you know, if you if you appeared in like let's say the first segment, first half hour, and you knew you weren't going to appear in the second or third, yeah, you get out of there. You just leave. Yeah, you know? yeah, kind of like an offer spot. Yeah, you just yeah. do it. You know, so so any other memories that he had of the, you know, do you have any memories of well, what you know, what did he what, did you ever see anything about Jimmy Gate? Yeah, he talked about Jimmy. Um, I don't remember a lot about it. He never said anything negative about Jimmy. Uh, so I, I just assumed they had a great relationship. You know. Jimmy had a, did he have a Western store in Nashville? Outside of Nashville? I think he did. I think there was, because Harold took me by, Harold took me by, I almost wore some Western wear. So you need to look into that. There was something Harold took me by and said, yeah, that's Jimmy's place. And I can't remember what it was. When, when I was 16, I was playing at a festival and Harold hired me actually to play the festival circuit with him for a couple of seasons. So you was just so you, you were born in 63. 63. So this was about 79. 78. Like 78. Yeah. So, uh, but I stayed in Harold's basement in Nashville. I did. 226 Moore Street. <laughs> Hendersonville, actually, where his house was at, and uh, and I'd go down there and uh, stay in the spare bedroom, and uh, his daughter was playing bass. And Kenny, get Kenny Clark. And Kenny was a guitar player. No. When it was here, and we played. Did you do the festival? We played festival. Like as big as state fairs or more uh, of like no, um, no, just fest, big like, grass festivals. Like oh, I see. Okay, um, like not even a so like Ozark Empire Fair. Or no, we no, we just did the fairs. We just just a blue blue blue, blue grass, grass circle. Yes, that's what like, we did. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I got to meet a lot of people there. You know, it's uh, I was a sixteen year old and standing in the middle of all that stuff and. You know, everybody loved Harold. Yeah, they all they all did. You know, everybody loved Harold. So he was like the he was the leader. Yes, he was leader of the band. Mm -hmm. It was his band. Harold Morrison and the Smoking Blue Records. What it was called. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was. Was that the first time you performed professionally? Well, it's pretty close. My dad, uh, my dad, and Charles and Jan Lee and Danny Hopkins. Had a little bluegrass, had a bluegrass band, Battlefield Bluegrass Express, and I was playing in that band. And uh, they were kind enough to put up with me screeching and clawing and playing all my stuff, you know. <laughs> uh, in fact, that might be a really good contact for you to talk to also. They were, Charles and Jan Lee were around here for years and years. They played it. They played all over the place. In fact, they're from actually Booger County also. They're from really? Yeah, they're from up in the same kind of area. Charles and Carol? Charles and Jan Lee. L-E-E? -E. Yes. I got their contact in there too. I'm going to come up. But yeah, they would be really, really good ones to talk to. Uh, 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 did Harold, so you mentioned you, you mentioned that Harold had a lot of stories about the Jubilee and Red Pearl. And well, he, he just he just talked a lot about, you know, uh, all the stars that were coming through there. I mean, everyone was coming through there. Just, you know, every, yeah. Everyone was there. Yeah. Uh, everybody that was somebody in the music business was coming there. He did he did say that, that starting the end, like the last year or something, they started bringing in other types of acts. Yeah. And that's kind of why they started losing some of their sponsorship. And it wasn't it wasn't what it was. I mean, people were watching the Jubilee to see, you know, the hillbilly kind of yeah. thing. And, and they, they were trying to... They were trying barbershop, to, a lot of barbershop stuff. Yeah, they were trying to dress it up a little more, I think. And, and uh, You ever mentioned a group called the Jubilaires? The Jubilaires. I don't remember that. Yeah, I don't but remember. But it really that. wasn't, I wouldn't say it was country music. Yeah. I'm not late 50s. Was it really yeah. Oh, yeah. They also got it for the uh, Western part of the 
then one show in 1962. It was like Gene Autry was the guest host. Gene had a drink and prop to kind of late dollars. I don't know. He was not very, he was, I don't know, he wasn't very sharp that night. I don't know why, but, um, and you could just see him read the cue card. You know? <laughs> very kind of a stilted delivery. And, you know, people don't understand, especially then, I'm sure people didn't understand all the consequences of being nationally recognized. It was, uh, you know, when, when I started playing with some of these really big artists, you know, just the things that we get to do, they can't do. Right. You know, they can't go to a restaurant. Right. They can't go to a movie. You right. know, I, I, me and Roy one night, Roy, Roy really liked uh, cars and races. And we tried to go to a race, and, you know, he covered up as good as he could. And, right. And, you know, we kept him away, and, and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, some people started recognizing him, and, and we just barely got him. I mean, they just yeah. hundreds of people started circling him, right. you know, we just right. had to. <clears throat> and I looked at him, and, and he said, when it starts, you can't stop it. Yeah. You know, he just wanted to see the race. He, yeah. just, he just wanted to be normal. He just wanted to go out somewhere and, and have breakfast, you know. He just can't do it. can't do it. You know, we, when we checked in hotels, he took him to the the back entrance, yeah. or you know, it's just yeah. yeah. And they sort of had to figure it out, like you know, have personal bodyguards and stuff. Right. And, you know. But that's what I'm going back to, like the uh, back to Red Bull and Hank Williams, and all those guys that that got so popular, they didn't understand, or part of the reason why, but they didn't understand the responsibilities of being nationally recognized. Yeah. And it becomes such a burden because actually it's like a jail. Yeah. It's like a prison. Yeah. And to be doing a weekly show. So uh, with the Grand Ole Opry, I think the sort of the basic, you know, if you join the Opry, you're expected to appear 26 yeah, you Saturday had to, nights. Yeah. Basically once every two weeks. Yeah. You had to be on. Yeah. Uh, so if you like Smell Like Fuller, well, you didn't have to get paid the grade. Yeah. You know, operating on it. it really became kind of a financial drag. Yeah. You, know, you make more money if you got out of it. Yeah. 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 You know, that's that's the thing, and that, that's one of the reasons actually they've changed that philosophy. I think you don't have to appear as many times. Really? That's, that's why uh, Roy Clark didn't become a member until actually just before I was. He didn't want to. He, he, well, I mean, you know, he was making. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, and, yeah. and then you go play an opera spot for five hundred bucks. So Roy was a good guy. Roy was a great guy. Yeah, Roy was an amazing, amazing guy. He, uh, great he, musician. Oh yeah, well, but uh, he treated me so nice well. Guy. Nice guy. Nice guy. You know, we just we had a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun together. You know. Uh, so back to Harold. Sorry, okay. but, you know That's right. you had an amazing life, but uh, don't want to take up too much of your time. No, you're and fine. and uh, so Harold was also a great tap dancer. Did you ever see him tap? Dance? I I've seen him dance on stage because sometimes he'd end up song and then he'd dance. Wow. But I never seen him tap dance. Yeah. I seen I've got him, a couple you know, of clips from the Jubilee where he launched into tap dance. I seen him do that hillbilly clog thing. Yeah, I would say that. I'm you know, <laughs> not a dancer, but uh, I never seen that. Look like Jeff dancer to me. You know, so, uh, uh, you know, he just seemed to be. He seemed to enjoy entertaining. Oh, that's he, that was his life. Yeah, he he wasn't happy until he was on stage doing something. Yeah, that's when he was the happiest when he could stand up. In fact, I remember one one winter. Uh, in fact, one of the winners actually, me and him went to Florida for five or six weeks, and we, we played the little operas and stuff. And it was me, me and him, and uh, I had a drum machine, and uh, we we were in his motorhome. We called it Little Melvin, <laughs> and, and we stayed down there and played those. You know, there's some big campgrounds down there that yeah. you know had little stages. Yeah. So it was, it 
was pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. And then my wife's family had a show up here. And uh, I can't remember, was it? Yeah, he played on. He played in Silver Dollar City here, but I can't remember. That might have been, yeah. He played in Silver Dollar City here. I got I got him one in Silver Dollar City. And we did a year there. And then he played for my wife's family for a year at the Rose Theater hmm. in Branson. Is that a place he played? Did he play for the Plummer family? I think he did. I don't know. But I know he did. He sort yeah. of finished his career in Branson. Yeah. Late 80s, I'm thinking. Yes, he was. Then he died in 93. Yeah. I got to see him in the hospital before he died. Really? Yeah. How was he? How was he feeling? Was he good spirits left? He was out. He was, he was out of it. Yeah. He's almost 60. Was it like a stroke? I think he was some kind of stroke or something. Yeah, yeah I think it was actually uh, the reports I've seen is he actually had a heart. It was a heart attack that killed him, but he had multiple yeah, he, he uh, health was, issues. When I was there, he, he, he just looked up and you know, just. He wasn't, he wasn't quite all there. No. Um, uh, so you, you, you knew his wife, too? Eagle Lou, huh? Yeah. What was she like? She was funny. She was funny, and, and she was very supportive always. You know, when we were around, she always, always tried to help. I forget the uh, year they got married, but they wanted to get married June 1st. Do you ever hear the story? You got bit by a copperhead. Yeah. <laughs> So they had to delay the uh, marriage till July 3rd. There so you go. Yeah. Yeah, I'd heard that story. <laughs> yeah, I'd heard that. How many kids did they have? They had three. Three daughters. Three daughters. Okay. Georgia, Gina, and uh, Carla. They still live in Florida? Uh, as far as I know. Does he make a connection with them? Does he live in Nashville? Or? You don't know. Georgia was, I can't remember. I think she I can't remember where she lived. She she lived away somewhere. But Carla, the last time I seen her, was outside of Nashville, and Gina lived outside of Nashville. Are they musicians at all? No. Well, Carla was. Carla was in the band actually when I was there. She was a bass player. The little bluegrass part, darling, is what they called her. Well, any other memories you want to share with uh, our just, listening audience? I've got a ton. It's got a ton. So, Grandpa Jones and Roy were in Silver Dollar City, and I was in the band in Silver Dollar City too. Darky Phillips, and Ray Moody, and, and Harold. And Harold was tight. He wasn't cheap. If he wanted something, he'd buy it, but he was always tight. With yeah, buddy. Yeah. And so was Grandpa Jones. <laughs> so they found this guy that uh, would give them strawberries and ice cream on the park. So in between sets, they went down and ate strawberries and ice cream for several bowls. And Harold was lactose and tall. <laughs> so we started playing the next set. And he was like, I'm about, I'm about. It was all a while. And he got sick to stuff and started throwing up on stage with strawberries and ice cream. And me and Greg Moody and our were laughing so hard. We couldn't even play. It looked like the Red Sea is part of it out there. <laughs> oh, I love it. So he just loved, you know, strawberries and ice cream, but he knew it. Oh, he knew he was like those Oh, he couldn't do it. He just he didn't just, care. He just, he was funny. In fact, uh, they had Kitty Wells as a special guest uh, at the amphitheater so Solar City when Harold hmm. was there. And me and Harold actually got to play the show with you. It was fun. Yeah. Harold once played the, the, the uh, Jubilee Promenaders, the mm -hmm. Square Dance Street. Yeah. So, you know, they turned professional. They came out of, of not MSU, but SMS. Mm -hmm. Well, they turned professional, and then they got a week gig down at uh, the Blue Room at the Hotel Rose Roosevelt in New Orleans. Oh, wow. And Harold played for them. I didn't know that. So he never mentioned anything. No, he didn't talk about that. Yeah. That not that been, I remember. That must have been fun. Oh, it had to be. Yeah. And music was different. Then. You know, I mean, it's it's very exciting now to play the big shows. But but it was it was in your 
I just kind of did. I mean, yeah. you know, there was no fixing anything. I mean, this this is what it is, and this is how it is. Yeah. And it's, it's different. And it's all, you know, it's all live. And it's yes. Like you just, you know, yep. deal with whatever comes at you. That's what you got to do. Yeah. Any other memories of Harold that you want to share? We can always follow up. If we, I would love to follow up. You got my contact up. information. That'd be great. I would so, love to follow up. So really, you know, um, uh, you know, I just got interested in the Jubilee. It's, uh, this amazing thing that came out of the Ozarks. Yes, it is. Um, and the fact that Cy Simon and Ralph Foster, and they just, they could, first of all, ABC couldn't rub two people together. That's right. They were just uh, Right. Actually, had nothing to lose. So when and this bailed them out, they, they, when they approached them, it must have been like, "Well, oh, yeah, nothing to lose. Let's try it." You know, and um, it was almost kind of like a surprise hit. It was, you know, and uh, that's always the best ones, though. I know, and um, so just the fact that they did that and sustained it for so long, I don't think they ever had more than like a. Uh, you know, the minimal, whatever it is, 16 week contracts. And yeah. so it's like, there was never, yeah. they never signed them on for two years. Right. It was always like, you know, and when you think, well, they just went along till September of 1960 and then they pulled the plug. No, they were, there were press reports that there's, oh, those are going to go off the air in 1958. You know? yeah. and it was just like, they were always fighting to get yeah. it on the air. Always had a good television audience. It was very diverse, um, and the cost of doing the show was much. It was the cost of that of the big show. I mean, that show was just no standard. Yeah, it was cheap and inexpensive to produce, and had a really good demographic. Um, just a you know pretty early days of television. Yeah. And television kind of came on by itself. Uh, kind of 48, 49, especially in like New York and LA. Yeah. And, uh, so it had been around for about uh, roughly 10 years, but I still say it was the early years of television. The thing that they had a hard time figuring out is like, okay, they knew which shows appealed to women, they knew which shows appealed to men, they knew which shows appealed to kids, but they couldn't find a show that would appeal to those three basic demographics. The Jubilee watch. Yeah, well, the, the demographic was like almost well, one third women, one third men, and one third kids. You know? The whole family yeah. would gather around and watch the Jubilee. Yeah. And broadly, it wasn't just you know Upland South, or it was like Ohio and you know, states that you wouldn't think of as good markets for that type of show, and it did well. Yeah. A lot of places, you know. Yeah. And the Scotty side it says uh, size son. The Jubilee brought country music into the growing suburban homes, you know, the neighborhood homes. So, uh, really groundbreaking. It was. And rock and roll was coming on yeah. too, so they were having to deal with that. Uh, anyway, it's just amazing achievement. So, uh, yeah, they, but it, you know, it's easier to list the people. That didn't appear on the Jubilee. Right. I mean, they're just talking about everybody who was anybody appeared on the Jubilee. That's what they wanted. Right. And they wanted these stories. Yeah. Um, but there were a lot of Ozarkers like Harry yeah. Wilson and right. Slim Wilson and Speedy Howard and Zed Dennis. You ever hear of Zed? Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what do you make of Zed's? Uh, you ever seen his fiddle? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about him. I've heard him talk about, but I don't know anything. Um, I'll send you some links. To, I'd love that. You know, just to watch Zed. Uh, I'd love that. Um, I think he was, you know, I'm not, I, I do not come from, from a musical family, and, uh, but I love his fiddle. He was good. Well, um, I'd like to hear some of it. Yeah, I'll show it. I'll send you some links. So. so I sure appreciate this. Well, I appreciate and, you. Let me know what you. And it's a treat to. Yeah, get a hold of Charlie and Jan. Yeah. It'd be great. To actually meet someone who played with. And lived in his basement for a while. Uh, I did. <laughs> Harold Morris. <laughs> well, you know, a couple months at a time. Yeah. You know, for a couple summers, I did that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. I was a kid. Got to walk on the stage. First time I ever played the Ernest Tub Record Shop was actually with Harold. And actually, my dad and my brother got to play with me Yeah. on the record shop. Uh, got to walk on stage at the opera. I never played the opera with Harold. Uh-huh. But I got to stand in the circle. Really? Yeah. And, but I mean, of course, after that, I played a lot. 
was that the after line. they uh, was that about after the new opera yeah. the new opera yeah. yeah. but I've got to play the run in the I've got to play yeah. yeah I got to play a lot with the opera great for that great um, okay and I should have mentioned at the top but we are at the Branson Branson Craft, Craft Mall Craft Forge Mall. Grill yep mm -hmm. uh, which you own started yes yeah you're the founder and well my wife and I my, my yeah. kids were or my daughter and son law work here. Uh -huh. And uh, my son's a firefighter in Springfield. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. um, and you have live music here? Yes. You, you, you folks are, are heard some of that music. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, so. Thursday, Saturday night, from 5 to 6.30. All right. And you're getting going to go do the Presley show. Yep, getting ready to go right now. All right. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much.